My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC 296 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and DraftKings plays. But before I do, let's look at the wild success that our premium members have been having. Over the last four months, our premium members have put up over four hundred thousand dollars in winning DraftKings tickets. Everything from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars, all the way up to $78,000, $50,000, $40,000 giant tournament takedowns. And it is not a coincidence that our premium members are doing this and having this wild success because they have tools and insight available from us like the DraftKings Optimizer. This is going to build lineups for you. You come in here, you click a few buttons, it is pre-loaded with the best ownership projections in the game, pre-loaded with the best scoring predictions in the game, and then it builds lineups for you. You're also going to get insight and information, who we think you should have in your cash core lineups, who we think should be in your GPP core lineups. And this cheat sheet will be fully populated every Friday before every single event with the ownership projections, with the scoring projections, and the leverage Plays. These are all proprietary numbers. We build these ourselves. I actually pay somebody. Whoa. I just slapped my microphone. I got so excited. I actually pay somebody to build this out. We have somebody with the greatest formula in this space that is putting up the best projections in the game. And again, they're loaded in the optimizer. All of this is available and so much more. You're going to get all these tools, all these fantasy options, all these analysts, and everything else in one massive, complete, very cheap package. Just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. It is only $10 a month. The optimizer alone is worth more than $10. The ownership projections alone are worth more than $10. The insight is worth more than $10. The bets, the picks, greatest package in this space, period, end of story. That has always been our goal. Have the most value add package in history. And we have that. It's it's just an objective fact. Let's go ahead and break down this card. We are down to 12 fights, and I am filming this before weigh-ins. Hopefully, we stay at 12 fights and everybody makes weight because this was a great card. We lost the Randy Brown fight, which that sucks. You don't want to lose fights. I want as many fights as possible on a card, but okay, we lost that fight. It is what it is. No big deal. But then we lost the Ian Gary fight, and that actually sucks. I was curious to see how that fight would go if Ian Gary is actually good or not when fighting these high-level guys. But anyway, let's go ahead and break down this card with the 12 remaining fights. Opening up was originally Randy Brown, but now we have Martin Badai taking on Shamil Gazeev. Martin Badai, heavyweight, obviously, and he's been doing very well. He's 11 and 0, or uh, sorry, 13 and 1 in his career. His opponent's 11 and 0. He's 4 0 in the UFC. He's a big heavyweight. He has some power in his hands. He's got some good pressure, uh, lots of volume in his strikes. He's got good footwork, and he throws everything with 100% intent. He averages almost six significant strikes per minute, but he is also hittable, and he could be a little bit of a slow starter. But he is coming off of, this was the most definitive win he's had in the UFC. He submitted Josh Parisian, landed 42 significant strikes in the first round, had a takedown, and submitted him. This is the first time that Martin Badai looked like, oh, okay, he can be that guy. He is a 13-1 and heavyweight because a couple of these fights were a little bit closer than they should have been. He's taking on the UFC newcomer Shamil Gazeev. You're not going to have any stats or data here because he hasn't fought in the official UFC just yet, but he's a large Dagestani. He doesn't wrestle. You're going to hear Dagestani. You're going to think that he's a little or a big Khabib Demagomedov. He is not. He's a striker. He can wrestle. But he also has terrible takedown defense. He gets taken down pretty often. When he wants to wrestle, he'll have some nice doubles. He'll drag you to the mat and he'll get it down. But he's got big power in his hands. He has spinning attacks. And he's got good, diverse set of opponents. Lots of times you get these undefeated guys. He's 11-0 or 12-0, 11-0. Yeah, 11-0 with 10 stoppages. Anyway, lots of times you get these guys. They're destroying local cavemen in whatever country they're from. And then they come to the UFC to fight real competition and they get sparked. I don't see that happening for Shamil. I think Shamil is actually that good. And if you go through his opponents, they have good records. They're actually good high-level opponents. He's been in dog fights before where he's getting taken down. He's getting his own takedowns. He's standing up. He's making things happen. That diverse set of opponents, those fights that have gone past the first round knockout, all of that stuff really has me thinking that Shamil is going to win this fight. He is $7,800. 
If he wins, he will win by finish. I do not think he's safe enough. He's a heavyweight. I don't think he's safe enough for your cash games, your single entry cash games. I do think you need some exposure to him in your large tournament, large field, multiple entry type games. I like Shamil to win this fight, but obviously Martin Badai has shown us four times already that he is a UFC caliber fighter. Then we have Andre Feely taking on Lucas Almeida. Andre Feely is one of the most unreliable and yet most talented fighters that the UFC has in their roster. At one point in time, he was going to be the next big thing coming out of Team Alpha Male. He was going to be the next Cody Garbrandt. He was going to be the next Uriah Faber. He's got very good high-level wrestling. He's got very good striking, good jiu-jitsu. But just like so many of these other guys... He gets into dogfights. He will stand there. He will swing wild. His chin can't always hold up. And he has that wrestling, and he doesn't always use the wrestling. He is coming off this win over Nathaniel Wood. This was a great fight. You see the knockdown? He was also knocked down, right? They exchanged knockdowns in that fight. The biggest difference was the striking. He just couldn't hang with Nathaniel striking. But this was a dogfight, and it was a really fun fight to watch. He's taking on Lucas Almeida. Lucas Almeida is a powerful striker himself. He's not a wrestler. He is a striker. He throws big, heavy one-twos. He comes forward. He sets up that big right hand. If he thinks he has you on skates or if he thinks there's some blood in the water, he's all in. He's all in. He will do anything he can to try to get that finish. He's very aware that he is a striker and not a grappler. If it gets to the ground, he half times will just stand up. Like, yeah, I don't want to be here. I'm out. And he'll just stand up and make you get up with him. The biggest issue is his takedown defense sucks. It sucks. It's only at 40%. It is the largest hole in his game. I still am going to pick him to win here because Andre Feely does not use his wrestling. If he used his wrestling, if I could trust Andre Feely to come out there and wrestle hard, easiest pick in the card because Lucas Almeida struggles defending takedowns. But Andre Feely has shown us time and time again, he doesn't wrestle when he should. He doesn't use an entire skill set that he has. So I'm going to go Lucas Almeida here. He is the underdog. He is priced at $7,700. He hits nuts hard. Andre Feely has a chin that, give or take, could go either way. And he doesn't use his wrestling, so I don't think Lucas Almeida is going to have to worry about defending takedowns. So Lucas Almeida is going to be the pick. $7,700 is an interesting price point. I would have loved to get him for a little less, and then he'd be a guarantee. But I think I'll have some exposure to Lucas Almeida here. He is definitely the pick. Then we have Tagir Ulenbekov taking on Cody Durden. This is a very interesting fight. The betting odds and the DraftKings pricing do not align. Betting odd-wise, Tagir Ulenbekov is pretty much a 2-to-1 favorite. DraftKings pricing-wise, it's almost even. That's unfortunate because I am on the other side of this fight. Tagir Ulenbekov is a dominant come-forward wrestler. He'll strike with you. He'll hang out. He'll throw some uh, nice jab out there, big power, and then he'll shoot takedowns. All of these wins, the three wins, are wrestle heavy. And this is the little Bruno Silva, and he's very good. Wrestle heavy here, wrestle heavy in the Nascimento win. The Nate Maness, one takedown, snatched his neck up, that was it. But the one time he fought somebody willing to wrestle him, he got dog walked. Tim Elliott came forward, he dropped him as well, but Tim Elliott came forward, out wrestled him, could dog walk, is an exaggeration before I get a nasty comment. He came forward, he got his own control time, took the gear down, and worked him. For that reason, I think Cody Durden is going to win. That is, Cody Durden and Tim Elliott are the same fighter. They throw power, they come forward, and they wrestle, 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 wrestle. Pressure, 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 pressure. That's exactly who Cody Durden is. And Cody Durden, sneakily, might be very good. Because if you look at his career, he had the interesting fight with Gutierrez. He lost to Flick in one of the wildest submissions we've ever seen. Then he beat a Corey Lang. Then Muhammad Makayev submits him quick after Cody gets that takedown. But then he hit a nice four-fight win streak. Bays kind of sucks. Nicholas Mata doesn't suck. Charles Johnson, not as good as uh, we all thought he was going to be, but he beats Smokes, Charles Johnson, 11 takedowns. And then the Hadley win was a very good win as well. As well. Jake Hadley had four takedowns over seven minutes of control time, and he just looked good. I think Cody Durden wins this fight. I would have loved a better discount than $7,900. Uh Frankly, if we're looking at the betting odds and those correlate to DraftKings pricing, he would be cheaper than this. I still think Cody Durden wins. I will probably have him in a lineup. But Tagir Ulenbekov, I mean, he's Tagir Ulenbekov is objectively the best fighter Cody Durden has ever fought. So we'll find out if Cody is good or if he's just beating 
the overrated Charles Johnsons, the never-rated JP Bays of the world. We'll find out. Should be a very good fight, grappler versus grappler. Whoever wins this fight is going to score a ton of points. So you definitely need one of them in your lineup. Then we have Casey O'Neill and Ariana Lipsky. This is another fight where I am on the underdog. Casey O'Neill, pretty big favorite here. She's a Muay Thai striker. That is her discipline. That is her background. She's got solid elbows and she is willing to brawl. But she also has worked in some takedowns. If we scroll her way down, four takedowns against Dobson. She then took down Procopio. She took down Shevchenko. This is not the good Shevchenko. Took down Shevchenko three times. Then she barely beat Roxanne Montefiore. Like barely beat Roxanne Montefiore. And then she did lose to Maya. So she's coming off back-to-back questionable performances but Casey O'Neill very good striker who has worked in some wrestling into her game she's taking on Ariana Lipsky Ariana Lipsky at one point in time was not very good right she was just sort of a pitter patter no power striker good movement da, 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 nothing really would happen then all of a sudden she added wrestling to her game this JJ Aldrich win was incredible. She looked spec. Look at the uh, $6,800. And she dominated that fight. She dominated that fight. Defended the takedowns. Got her own takedowns. Landed 101 significant strikes. And then it's like, all right. You know, that's just JJ being JJ. JJ's unreliable. That wasn't an Ariana win. That was a JJ loss. Then she came in. It was a close fight with Gatto. But she stuffed the takedowns and got her own. She is three for three in takedowns in her last two fights. 100% of the takedowns she's offered, she has gotten in her last two fights. And in these last two fights, Gatto and Aldrich, she has defended 19 takedowns. So we have Casey O'Neill coming off two not so great performances and Ariana Lipsky coming off two phenomenal performances. I am going to go ahead and pick Ariana Lipsky to win this fight. If she could defend those takedowns, if she can sneak in some of her own takedowns, all of a sudden Ariana Lipsky is pretty good. Winning these fights and looking good along the way. Problem is, she doesn't score that well in her wins. Yes, she is a discount at $7,500, but this could look exactly like this Gatto win. With one takedown, defend a bunch of sloppy shots, pitter-patter strikes, 66 points. So I probably am not going to have Ariana Lipsky in my lineup, but I do think she wins this fight. And I think that these two women are on different trajectories right now. Then we have Cody Garbrandt taking on Brian Kelleher. 9 thousand dollar Cody Garbrandt I think he wins this fight he is the far better fighter but I don't know if he's worth that money and probably not worth the money because it might look exactly like this Trevin Jones wins at 56 points Cody Garbrandt former world champion Cody Garbrandt has the single best performance in the history of the UFC if we scroll all the way down to this fight when he beat Dominic Cruz this is literally the single best performance. Didn't score that well, but it is literally the single best performance we have ever seen from a fighter in the UFC. His footwork was incredible. His hands were incredible. His takedowns were there. Like, he looked unbelievable. Won that belt. Smoked the shit at a TJ Dillashaw before getting excited and caught. Smoked the shit at a TJ Dillashaw again before getting excited and getting caught. The Munoz loss wasn't good. All of a sudden, he's got no chin. He absolutely smokes poor Rafael Asuncao then Rob Font pieces him up Kai Kara France puts him out and then he just beat Trevin Jones for Cody Garbrandt to be the almost three to one favorite the nine thousand dollar fighter in this matchup is a bit a bit exaggerated I do not think he's worth this money although I do think he wins because he's taking on Brian Kelleher Brian Kelleher is a well-rounded guy he's not amazing anywhere but he's good enough everywhere Brian Kelleher has fought some of the best people in the division. He's lost to them, but he's beaten everybody he's supposed to beat. Sure, he beat the shit out of Kevin Kroon, beat Pilarte, lost to Ricky Simone. Okay, you're supposed to lose to Ricky Simone. And that's been the story of Brian Kelleher's career. Like, right outside the ranked fighters. Good everywhere, great nowhere, but this fight was embarrassing. This was an embarrassing fight. The guy was jumping guillotine, just had absolutely nothing to offer. He looked horrendous. TJ, or TJ Dillashaw. Cody Garbrandt wins this fight. Cody Garbrandt should not be in your lineup. Brian is a tough guy. I do not see him getting slept. And even if he does get slept, as we saw with some of Cody's scoring, doesn't do that well. Not He scored 88 points in a knockout win. 
He's a $9,000 price point. I don't see him being worth that. I am not having Cody Garbrandt in my lineup, even though he should win. Irene Aldana versus Carol Rosa. I'm very confident in Irene Aldana to win this fight. Not go spend my money on a bet confident, but I am confident that the title challenger, who has great striking, can win this fight. My concern, though, is she lost to Amanda Nunes. It was a wrestling match. Amanda Nunes took her down 100 times, and that's how she beat her. She lost to Holly Holm. It was a wrestling match. Holly Holm's a former professional boxer and didn't box with Irene Aldana. She was that worried about it, so she wrestled and took her down over and over. My concern, though, is we have seen many women work their way up the ranks, get themselves that title shot. Right? Not even just women, many fighters, I should say. Get that title shot, lose, and then just spiral for a little bit. That's my concern here with Irene Aldana, but she hits very, very hard. You can see she stopped Chasson, stopped Santos, stopped Vieira. Even in her decisions, she scores pretty well because the volume is incredible. 125 significant strikes out of 127 landed. I do think Irene Aldana wins this fight. I don't know if she's going to win by stoppage because Carol Hossa is very, very tough and a decision queen. Look at all these decisions. That's all she does. Alternating wins and losses. She's another one beating who she's supposed to, losing to the higher ranked type fighters. Irene Aldana should be the better fighter here. But Carol Hosa, who has been known to wrestle, took down Lena Landsberg, took down Molly McCann. The loss is embarrassing, but she did take down Molly McCann. She did take down Santos in that last fight, in that win. That's uh, Kunitskaya, formerly. Carol Hosa is a busy striker. She lands almost six significant strikes per minute. She is willing to trade. She is a decision fighter. Carol Hosa makes more sense for your $7,400 than Irene Aldana does at your $8,800, even though I think Irene Aldana wins this fight. Then we have Dustin Jacoby versus Alonzo Menafield. This is another interesting fight to break down because Dustin Jacoby, former professional kickboxer. If we scroll through his career, look at the dates, right? 2023, 22, 21, all makes sense. But if we scroll all the way down, 2011, 2012, he was in the UFC way back then, was just getting out grappled, couldn't hang in MMA. He was a kickboxer. Went back to kickboxing. Had a very successful career in glory. Was ranked number two in the world in the best kickboxing promotion on the planet. Then he came back to MMA and really started to make stuff happen. The Kutalaba fight was incredible. It, the fact that that was a draw after all those takedowns was incredible. And he put himself on a nice little win streak. And you can say, oh, he's hit a bit of a skid. The Roundtree fight, I thought he won that fight. I thought he won that fight. The Merzikhanov fight, he would have won that fight. He did get dropped, which is not a good look. And that does worry me about his chin. But he was going to win that fight. If he didn't get dropped, he wins that fight. And then he absolutely smoked Kennedy and Chuckle. So Dustin Jacoby, very good kickboxer. Typically not a power guy. He did knock out Jung. He did knock out Chuckle, but he's typically not a power guy. He is fighting a power guy, though, in Alonzo Menafield. Alonzo Menafield is a giant powerful, insanely fast striker. He will come forward, throw with 100%, 100%, 100%, and try to take your head off. He just retired Jimmy Crute. You'll see it was a submission. It's not. He didn't get a takedown and submit him. That's just not how that fight went. But in this fight, that was a draw because of a point deduction. He beat the piss out of Jimmy Crute. Dropped him twice, probably dropped him 11 times when you actually watch that fight. If you watch that fight, he was just doing whatever he wanted to on the feet to Jimmy Crute. He did have some low fight IQ moments, though. Wasn't striking as much as he should have been, considering that he was just bobbleheading that dude. Point being, Alonzo Menafield, very good striker. Plenty of cardio. That used to be a knock on him. That is no longer an issue. Very good striker with plenty of cardio that could absolutely take your head off. I think Dustin Jacoby wins this fight. I think he dances around. I think he uses his technique and he's the better striker and then uses that clean striking technique to beat Alonzo Menafield. With that being said, $7,100 Alonzo Menafield covers his salary time and time again. Even in a decision, he did not finish Ed Herman, but he put up 74 points. Fabio Charant, he submitted him, but that was a, again, he's getting these submissions, but it, it wasn't like an arm bar. It was a choke, and he just applied a ton of pressure. Big, strong guy made that happen. Alonzo Menafield is somebody that you should absolutely consider in your lineup. Let me just go back to Dustin Jacoby very quickly. He's $9,100, and in these decisions, he doesn't score that well. 
80 points in a decision. 91 points in a decision, okay, we broke even there. And then in the finishes, obviously, he puts up a couple of points, but I don't know if he's finishing. Alonzo Menafield is crazy tough. Dustin Jacoby is probably not a guy I'm going to have in my lineup, even though I do think he wins just using clean technique. Then we have the, oh, uh, this is actually the main card now. This is no longer the feature prelim. This is on the main card. We have Bryce Mitchell stepping up on insanely short notice, taking on Josh Emmett. Bryce Mitchell, everybody's favorite redneck. He will just dive at your shoes. He's just head first, diving at shoes, sniffing feet, tying shoelaces, everything possible except striking. He is not striking with anybody. He's just diving, shooting, diving, shooting, diving, shooting, trying to get to your feet, trying to get to your feet, trying to get the takedowns, and he does get those takedowns. Five takedowns against Dan Ige. Only took down Taporia once, but Taporia could potentially be champion in six months from now. He took down Barbosa four times. Took down Andre Feely seven times. Rosa three times. Like, this guy is a nonstop wrestler grappler. Look how low these significant strike numbers are. He's barely throwing anything. He's wrestling like crazy. And that would normally be concerning because Josh Emmett is a wrestler. Josh Emmett has wrestled his whole life. Josh Emmett has achieved things in wrestling that Bryce Mitchell could never achieve. Bryce Mitchell, I, I'm not trying to be a complete dick here and people are going to leave whatever. Bryce Mitchell, as far as straight wrestling is concerned, is not a very good wrestler. He's just not. He's accomplished almost nothing in the sport of wrestling. But what Bryce Mitchell has done insanely well is take that wrestling tenacity, his willingness to sniff other people's feet, and translate that into MMA. In MMA, Bryce Mitchell's a great wrestler. In real life, Josh Emmett is 10 times the wrestler that Bryce Mitchell is. But in a cage, Josh Emmett doesn't use that wrestling. He took down Rodriguez once in a fight that he was getting his face smashed in. Then we have to go back to Shane Burgos to see a little bit of wrestling. One takedown. The reality is Josh Emmett wants to sit there on a right hand, twirl it around, and then just wing it. That is all Josh Emmett is looking to do is take somebody's head off. I don't know if he has bad knees from years of... I don't know what it is, but he has the wrestling. He doesn't use it. Because of that, I have to go Bryce Mitchell. I have to go Bryce Mitchell. Josh Emmett telegraphing a huge right hand. Bryce Mitchell will lower his level and have his forehead in your cup immediately. That's just what he's going to do. I think Bryce Mitchell wins this fight, and I think you need him in your lineup because all those takedowns, all that control time scores very, very well. Then we got Patty the Batty. Patty the Batty, $9,400. Patty the Batty is not a $9,400 fighter. He's just not that good. I love him. He's fun to watch. He will go out there. He will get finishes. He had three finishes Three fights, his first UFC fights, up, down, finished, got it done. But he got hit a little bit against Luigi Vendramini. Vargas, that was a sloppy fight. Jordan Levitt, he actually that was a got that win. And then Jared Gordon, a lot of people don't think he won this fight. He only put up 63 points. He was taken down three times. The striking stats were dead even. A lot of people don't think he won that fight. But what Patty is, is tough. He will come forward. He's tough. He's not a quitter. He's not a pussy. Sometimes his abilities will hold him back. But he is very tough, and he will come forward, and he will work hard. He's taken on a 67-year-old Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is on a six-fight skid. It's one of the worst skids we've ever seen in our life. If you're going to defend Tony Ferguson, what you're going to say is, but look who he lost to. He lost to Justin Cagey. He lost to Charles Oliveira. He lost to Dariush. He lost to Michael Chandler. These are, every single one of these guys either held the belt or fought for the belt. Okay, he lost to Diaz. That's not a great one. And then he lost to Green. Oh, God, it's not a great one either. So all of a sudden, Tony Ferguson, on a six-fight skid, after being hailed or predicted or uh, projected to be the guy that could beat Khabib Namagamadov. The problem is, something happened here. Between all of these fights, this wild, successful win streak, this was one of the most impressive streaks we've ever seen. I forget how many it was. I could count it now, but that's not great television. All of these wins... Fought Justin Gagey for the belt and something happened. Justin Gagey beat whatever common sense, whatever normal was left in Tony Ferguson. Justin Gagey beat it out of him. Ever since this fight, Tony Ferguson has never been the same. Looks good for a minute, done. Looks good for a minute, done. Looks good for a minute, done. 
He got a DUI this year. His wife filed a restraining order. There's just a lot going on in Tony Ferguson's head, and it's not going to translate into a win in this fight. The UFC knows exactly what they're doing in this matchup. I think Patty has to be the pick. As far as spending the money on him, it's a game-time decision. He is capable of finishing, but Tony Ferguson, as crazy and psychotic as he is, he's getting finished when you land baseball bat power strikes. He's getting finished by a wild high-level jiu-jitsu black belt. Ah, the sub by Bobby Green wasn't the best thing I've ever seen in my life. But it's going to be your call if you want to throw Patty in your lineup. He's very, very expensive, but I just think Patty wins this fight 9 out of 10 times at this point in their career. Shavkat Rachmanov taking on Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Shavkat Rachmanov is that guy. He just is that guy. He will be in my lineup. He's very, very expensive at $9,700, but he's just that guy. He's just that good. He's submitting people. He's knocking people out. He has wrestling. He has striking. He. The only concern is he has not been to a decision yet. And he might be a Gabriel Bonfim, where all of a sudden the fight goes a little longer, you're not out of there, and there's an issue. But... He did take Jeff Neal into the third round. He was just toying with him. No takedowns. Just toying with Just striking. Playing that game. And he still put up 98 points. I think Shavkat is this next generation of fighter. High level wrestling. High level striking. He'll snatch you up in a submission. He'll knock your head off. I like Shavkat Rachmanov to win this fight. He is taking on Wonderboy. I mean, look at, look at this guy. Look how good. Look at this guy. Look at him. He's incredible looking. He has an incredible personality. He's an incredible fighter. The problem is he's 40 years old. And I don't think that karate style striking is going to matter here. I think Shavkat Rachmanov is going to come forward, stay in his face, keep the distance close, and take away all the karate stuff that Stephen Wonderboy Thompson has going on. When he can do that wide stance, he can pop in, pop out, do, he can be successful. If Shavkat's going to stay in his face, close that distance, not give him room to breathe or stretch, then Shavkat's going to win this fight. And I think that's what's going to happen. I love Wonderboy. He's one of my all-time favorite fighters. How, how you could not like Wonderboy is beyond me. You're just like a weird hater to be a weird hater. The big question is going to be, does Shavkat wrestle? If he does, he'll beat him the same way Burns did, the same way Bilal Muhammad did. If he doesn't, well, it might be a weird striking fight. Steven, at 40 years old, Wonderboy is still insanely tough. He's not going to quit on you. He will stay there. He will strike. He will do all the things. I love Wonderboy. I hope this is not his last fight in the UFC, but uh, the UFC is punishing him by giving him Shavkat Rachmanov. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have Alexandre Pantoja defending his belt for the very first time against Brandon Royval. This is a rematch. He beat Brandon Royval already, and he put up 99 points. Pantoja is going to be in my lineup. This was two years ago. What are we doing? It was two years ago, and it wasn't a fluke. What are we doing here? How is he only 8,600? How is he only a 2-to-1 favorite? He's not even a 2-to-1 favorite. He's minus 170. How is this guy not minus 350 right now? He beat his opponent already. Took him down three times and beat him. Submitted him. I, I don't know why this looks like this, but I will gladly take it. Pantoja has proven that he's got cardio. He went full five rounds with Brandon Moreno and took him down in the fifth round. Full cardio. Comes forward. He will strike. He will grapple. He's insanely tough. He's fought some of the best people in the world. I mean, look at this. Look at this guy's resume. And we're going to go over to Brandon Royval. Brandon Royval, yes, is so exciting. He's so exciting. Feast or famine. Stoppage, 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 stoppage. First ever decision win against Bontorin. Or at least first decision win in the UFC. And then stoppage, stoppage. He is very dangerous. Brandon Royval can catch you in a submission. He can catch... I mean, what putting out Matouche Nikolaou the way he did was very impressive because Matouche Nikolaou is this high-level striker that we thought was going to really use that technique, use his speed and all of that to win this fight. Brandon Royval said, not today, and made that happen. But I just don't see Brandon Royval winning this fight. Brandon Royval will always be a very exciting guy. I don't think he'll ever be an elite guy. I don't think he'll ever be champion. I think Pantoja beats him the exact same way he beat him the first time. He's going to be in my lineup. That's a very, very good price point. Probably the best value on this card, and hopefully I don't look stupid. Main event, Leon Edwards, Kobe Covington. If you think Leon wins, do not put him in your lineup. 
He does not score well. 79 points against Leon the first time, or second time, third time, technically. 84 points when he knocked him out. 91 against Diaz. Okay, he could cover his salary. He had four takedowns in that fight. All of a sudden, he's getting taken down. That Diaz clobbered him. Let me rephrase it. Diaz had him on ice skates. I do think Leon Edwards wins this fight. So don't let this trash talk make you think that I don't. I, I think he wins this fight. I think Colby Covington's just a little too old. The layoff's a little too long. And all of a sudden, Leon Edwards, who is feeling himself, who is the champion, can win this fight. He's got to be a little bit busier than normal. He's got to let his hands go and not worry about the takedowns. But I think Leon wins this fight. And I am not going to put him in my lineup. He just does not score that well. And especially against a guy like Colby Covington, that is going to be shooting, 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 shooting. Non-stop wrestling, 10 takedowns, three takedowns, six takedowns. Non-stop wrestling will be coming from Colby Covington. Non-stop wrestling. That is going to keep Leon Edwards' significant strikes down, and it's going to prevent him from really going off. I think he defends the strikes, or defends the takedowns, gets his hands going a little bit. I think he will have some success. I think he wins the fight, and I think it looks exactly like the last fight. And he didn't cover his salary then. Kobe Covington, on the other hand, covers his salary. 157, 139, 172, 136, 116, 141, 131, 116. This guy puts up numbers, and it's because of the wrestling, because of the pressure, because of the pace, because of the control time. And these are three-round fights. 141 points in a three-round fight. That is nuts. That is nuts. Kobe Covington should probably be in your lineup. Even if you think he put up 50 points against Usman in a loss. 50 points. I think Kobe Covington should be in your lineup. I think this is a very close fight. I don't have a bet on this fight because it's so close. And Kobe could be the highest scorer that we have ever seen in the history of time. Let's go back to Leon Edwards. Before you people say he's going to knock him out. This dude has one knockout in the last five years, six years, one knockout. And the other one against Sabata. How's he? How's his career going? How's Sabata doing lately? That's just not who Leon Edwards is. He's not. He's got nine decision wins in the UFC, especially at this level. Kobe is very tough. I think Leon wins. I think he wins a close decision. And it's really going to come down to if the judges care about wrestling offense or wrestling defense. That is my breakdown. Guys, become a premium member. It's freaking $10 a month. What are we doing? Not only is it $10 a month, the minute that UFC 296 is over, the UFC Vegas 84 picks, bets, and information will be up on that website, ready to go. I don't know what a three-week break is. There's no breaks here. So if you're paying for somebody's Patreon and some other bullshit, and they're taking a break, that is not good. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's only $10 a month. Look what the rest of our members have been doing in this space. Sign up now. It's only freaking $10. Hey, and good luck. Last pay-per-view of the year.